It's why we're here. It's why we gather. It's why we can celebrate on a day like today. If we haven't met, my name is Aaron Treadway. I get the absolute privilege of getting to serve as the lead pastor here at Fellowship Bible Church. And I'm not sure where your thoughts have gone over these last six to 12 months, but as I've been reflecting over the events of this past year and how we've been navigating this global pandemic, I really believe that the message of Easter, it couldn't be more relevant than it is today. You see, we've all been impacted over the last 12 months in different ways. There are so many different things that we've been experiencing together, from sickness to social distance, from isolation to anxiety, from equity to employment, we've all been impacted. And for you, things might feel different. They do for me. Things might feel like they have changed, probably because they have. And, and some of us are, are most likely wondering, are things ever going to get back to normal? Are, are we ever going to go back to what we were doing or thinking or how we were behaving 12 months ago? See, these are the days that we've been living through. And as I thought about these days over the last year, what I've come to believe is that these are, are probably a one in 100 type of, of event, right? A hundred years could go by, we're probably only going to have one year like the one we've done, we've had. But what I love about Easter is that this is a day that we gather to celebrate something that happened one time for all time. One time in history, one time in eternity, the Son of God gave His life for the sin of the world. This is the message of Easter, that Jesus died, but He did not stay dead. It's why we're here, and we can rejoice, and we can have hope, and we still are navigating the pandemic together. Right? There's, there's still some road ahead of us, but there's something that I want you to understand this Easter. Even in the face of this pandemic, we continue to face, and it's this. The thing you see isn't always what it appears to be. If you have your Bible this morning, go ahead and pull it out. If you've got a Bible app on your phone, that's great too. Pull that out. Find the Gospel of Mark this morning. For the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you an Easter story. You might have heard it, but I want to focus on the perspective of one woman who saw with her own eyes Jesus crucified. This woman, she saw Jesus beaten, and she saw him suffer, and she saw Jesus take his final breath. This woman's name is Mary Magdalene. That very first Easter morning... Mary had this interesting change of perspective where she came to understand but also believe that the thing you see isn't always what it appears to be. We'll pick up her story, Mark chapter 15. We'll start in verse 42. This morning it says this. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. So he called for, for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead. So Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought this long sheet of linen cloth, then took Jesus' body from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. And then this man, Joseph of Arimathea, he took this very large stone, a, a boulder, and he rolled it in front of the entrance. And these are the events that lead up to the first Easter morning. Just after the crucifixion, there's this prominent Jewish man named Joseph of Arimathea, and he goes to the governor, another man named Pilate. He requests the opportunity to bury Jesus. Notice in verse 45, it says this. Jesus was dead. 
doesn't say he might be dead or he looks dead or maybe possibly it could be or maybe not or, or it could be that Jesus is dead. No, historically, every historical document says that Jesus did live, but he also died that day. You might have heard this story. Joseph of Arimathea takes Jesus' dead body. He takes it off the cross. He wraps Jesus' dead body in this linen cloth that he had purchased. And he carries the dead body to a tomb. It was carved out of this cave in, in a rock, the word says. But I want you to see something. Look what was happening. All of this is going on. And there was someone there. Joseph of Arimathea and Pilate and the officer and Jesus and the tomb. But there was one who witnessed. All of this. I want you to see this verse 47. It says, Mary Magdalene saw where Jesus was laying. This woman, Mary, was a witness. She was there when Jesus was crucified. She saw Joseph of Arimathea lay Jesus' body in this, this tomb that was carved in this rock. See, she had followed him from the cross to the grave. And then she sees this man, Joseph, roll this large stone in front of the tomb. That's what she saw. Historically, Jesus was dead. Look what happens three days later. Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Here's what it says. When the Sabbath was over... Mary Magdalene, the, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought some spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they began to ask each other a very interesting question. They began to ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? It is the very first Easter Sunday, and it is the day that Jesus conquered the grave, the day that Jesus rose victorious over sin and death. And we find this woman, Mary, walking with her two friends, and they're heading towards the tomb. They have one very clear expectation, and we know what it is based on the text. They're walking through the dark. They are carrying these expensive spices that were used in this time for embalming bodies, dead bodies. Why are they carrying these spices? It is very obvious. They believe Jesus is dead. That's what everybody is confirming. That's what they believe. So these ladies buy these spices three days after the crucifixion. They are walking through the dark and they are asking each other these questions and they are debriefing because they are going to embalm Jesus' dead body. They are going to prepare Jesus' dead body to stay dead. It's very interesting, at least to me, because repeatedly throughout his lifetime and especially over the final three years of Jesus' life, he told all of his followers that he was going to die. In fact, he told them that he had to die for the sin of the world. But the interesting thing is that he also said, I will rise. He predicted that. He said of himself, I will die, but I will conquer death. I will defeat the grave. And so I wonder, have you ever thought to yourself of you, as you've examined this story, where was everyone? that first Easter morning. If Jesus had told them all exactly what he was going to do, he would die, but he would rise. Have you ever thought to yourself, why wasn't anyone congregating at the tomb? Why weren't they waiting in anxious anticipation? Why weren't they camping out? See, I would have camped out, and I don't even like camping, but I would have been there, and I would have been waiting and watching and believing that Jesus was going to rise from the grave. That's what he said he was going to do. But I think the problem on that first Easter morning, and maybe it's a problem that some of us experience at times as well. Hope was dead. That's how people felt. Their hope was dead. It's why Mary and her friends start to speculate on the way to the tomb. Remember what they asked? 
They're asking each other, who's going to do it? Right? Is it you? Is it you? Who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? The message version translates this in a way that I love because I think it's more specific. It says, the women began to worry out loud to each other. It's what they were doing, walking and talking about the things that had happened, the events, and they're in shock. And grief has now set in three days later, and they're trying to process. So what do they do? They worry out loud to each other. Started to think here to myself, do you ever do that? Like as you think about the events, the circumstances that you face, you ever just start to worry? Maybe out loud to other people, and you start to worry, and you worry some more, and then you're worried, and your worry makes you worry, and so you worry even more. I think so often when we look at our situation, we do worry. We fret, and we start to feel at times overwhelmed, because we find so often, even for followers of Jesus, go with me, our hope is in ourselves. You might know Jesus. You might know that he's in control. You might believe that. But when these situations of life face you, when you're staring at these circumstances, it's so easy to start to trust in ourselves. I think that was the problem for Mary. She starts to think about this stone that was rolled. She saw it rolled in front of the tomb. She starts to think, how am I going to do it? It's impossible. It's kind of like uh, trying to teach my five-year-old how to ride a bike. <laughs> Parents, you with me? Anyone? Can I get, I'm phoning a friend here. Okay, here we go, yes. My wife and I, my wife's right there. She, we bought him a bike for Christmas this past Christmas. There it is, yep, there he is, and there it is. He was four at the time, and it's red, and it's his favorite color. It's got this number and these amazing racing stripes. And this guy is totally into the bike. He can't ride it, doesn't know how, never had a bike, but he loves this bike. And he should, because parents, you've probably been here as well. It's 1 a.m. on Christmas Eve, Tigers. You've been there, and you're assembling the thing, right? And you're like, am I ever going to sleep? Okay, that's maybe just me. I'm not sure. But you're staying up all night, but it's worth it. They run down the stairs, and they come out of their bedroom, and they see the presence. In this case, he sees the bike, and he is pumped. And he, like, this is the greatest day that he has ever had in his four years at that time. It's all joy. It's all celebration. You're getting the picture, right? It's celebration until, do you see those things in the very back of the bike? Anyone? Until he sees those things. And he's like, wait a second. What are those? That's right. I heard somebody. It seems obvious, doesn't it? He didn't, he's never had a bike. They're training wheels. And I think nothing of the question. I don't know if you would have, but I'm like, oh, man, they're, they're, they're training wheels. They're going to help you. They're going to be great. They're going to help you learn to ride your bike. You would have thought that I had just told them that those things were molten hot lava. Or like killer bees that sting his feet. Every time he pedals, he's going to get another bee sting. Because this guy starts to go crazy. And he's like, no! No! I don't need any help! Right? I don't want help! I can do it myself. I think it was my wife who talked him down. But as I've been thinking about that over the last few months, still doesn't know how to ride a bike. I started to think, for so many of us, this is how we view life. When we look at our circumstances, we think about our situation, we think, I can do it. I can manage it all by myself. And so we, we start to think that it's all up to us. And that's how we start to act, like we don't need help. And I think what happens is we start to carry around this unnecessary weight. That's what I've come to believe as I've, I've gone further in my journey with Jesus. That Jesus offers to carry the weight of our life, the weight of our sin. But so often by our own doing, we choose to carry it ourselves. 
I think this is why Mary and her friends were concerned that first Easter morning. Because they looked at this stone as something impossible to move. Maybe that's what you've done. Maybe you walked in this morning. Maybe you're watching online and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I've heard this story, but I've got this thing in my life. I can't figure it out. Maybe it's abuse that's part of your past. It might be a, a loss that you've experienced or a divorce. Maybe you're even going through that right now. I think the reality is that we all have these things. All of us. It is the human experience that we all share in, for better or for worse. We have things in our lives that seem impossible to move. This is why the message of Easter is so ex important. Because Easter, it reminds us that hope isn't dead. Hope is alive. Right? That is the, the gospel message that God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, to be the sacrifice for my sin and for your sin. That God sent Jesus to pay the penalty for all the ways which we fall short of His standard of perfection. Because something had to be done. Someone had to pay the price. So God sent Jesus to do for us what all of us could never do for ourselves. There's no way that we could ever do enough good stuff or enough good deeds to outdo or to undo all the bad that we've done. So Jesus, he does for us. What we cannot do for ourselves. He went to the cross. He died a horrible death for our sin. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Amen? Amen. That's not the end of the story. The cross. Well, we're here. What we celebrate today. The cross is not the end of the story. You see, on a Friday, the cross is this symbol of death and defeat and destruction. It's a symbol of the loss of hope. But I want you to see what happens here. Look what happens when Mary arrives at the tomb. Mark chapter 16, verse 4. It says, When Mary looked up, she saw that the stone, which was very large, it had been rolled away. As she entered the tomb, she saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. We're told in Luke's gospel that this young man was an angel. And the angel says, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. That first Easter morning, are you picturing the scene? Mary is walking through the dark with her friends. She is going to embalm Jesus' body because she saw Jesus die and she saw him suffer and she watched him placed in this tomb. She was a witness as the stone was rolled in front of the grave. Mary believed Jesus was dead. But look what the angel says, Luke 24, verse 5. It records the same exact conversation. The angel says to Mary, this famous line, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. You see, my friends, this is the great news of Easter. That the thing you see, it isn't always what it appears to be. Mary saw the stone that seemed impossible for her to move. And Mary saw the stone as a symbol of death and defeat and destruction. And to Mary, the stone, it represented the loss of hope. But I want you to think about this. See, for some reason, I've been reading this story for almost 30 years. Something new occurred to me this year. I prepare for Easter like months in advance. So this was a few months ago, and I've been sitting on this 
waiting to share this with you for two or three months now, so forgive me if it's, you know, it just comes out. But look at the stone. The same thing that Mary saw as the symbol, the greatest symbol of destruction, was the exact same thing that revealed the resurrection three days later. Is that amazing? It's the same exact stone. She's looking at the same exact object. It signified death and defeat and loss. And it becomes the thing when rolled away that reveals the very power of God. The thing you see isn't always what it appears to be. And so often it's just a very small change in our perspective that changes everything in our life. If you were at the drive-in this past Friday and Saturday, you might have seen this and kind of how this worked. This thing is way above my pay grade. I have no idea how we, we created it. It was actually Chris, our newest pastor. But let's just do a quick exercise because I know a lot of you weren't here Friday and Saturday. This side of the room, my left, your right, what have you been looking at? What do you see for the last 15, 20 minutes? Go ahead. Fear. Fear. Great, great. Now just hang with me, you middle people. Okay? <laughs> Online, you hang with me too. Over here. Oh, interesting. Hope. Okay, I got you. I told you I'd get to you. What do you guys see? That's interesting. You just see like a garbled mess. This thing is called perception art. Again, above my pay grade. But what is amazing about this thing, when, when Chris told me, hey, I can make this thing, I'm like, you cannot make this thing. But when he said I can make this thing, and I saw this thing, and I kind of walked over here, and I'm like, huh, fear. And I walk over here, and I see hope. It's unbelievable, because the same thing that we're all looking at is different based on the perspective that you might have, based on your vantage point. And I want you to just see how this has played out in the life of somebody who's very close to me. He's a good friend of mine. His name is Bobby, and this is his story. Take a look. 2015 was one of the hardest years of my life. You know, I was just living life flying by the seat of my pants, partying, drinking all the time, was going through a divorce, you know, dating my wife now. And I remember, I'll never forget, just uh, having a little bit too much uh, to drink, getting in an argument, uh, police being called, you know, and I just, at that point, you know, I, I wanted it to end. And, uh, you know, my now wife, called the police because she had enough and I just remember I'll never forget being handcuffed as my ex-wife took my my daughter who was then one and a half away from me and just being arrested and going to jail and you know you think that would be my rock bottom but it, it wasn't two weeks after that my mom passed away and you know it was just like one thing after another I get arrested I lose my daughter my mom dies, I find out I have cancer, and this is a span, you know, of a couple months. And I remember, you know, facing chemo and everything else, and for some reason I thought I could handle it. That my strength was the selfishness, you know, the self-centeredness I had. You know, I looked at it as an excuse to just drown my sorrows. And, um, you know, that worked until it didn't. For me, I hit rock bottom by myself at home, just spiritually so sick. Committed to going to, to rehab, I had to do something about it. Went to rehab, got out of rehab, met a gentleman named Rick Malacher, um, who encouraged me to come back to church. And at that point, I had, I had nothing. I, did, I had supervised visitation with my daughter. I remember giving it a try, walking through the doors, and I remember, you know, that feeling that I had um, of hope. You know, I started doing devotionals. I started to get into the Word. I had a battle ahead of me. I had a, I had a lot, but I, I, I know I, at that point I couldn't fight it alone. I ex truly accepted Christ in my life. 
it was just like a, this beautiful sunrise that just came up over my life. And I remember throughout the whole court case, two and a half years, this custody battle, you know, just r relying on God. Everything that happened, I wouldn't take it back, knowing that what I know now. I have a beautiful wife who is always pushing me spiritually to think today that I'm part of this church community and that, you know, day by day, like just relying on God. It, it's just unbelievable. Like, it, it's just, by the grace of God, like I get this wonderful life and it, it, and like, I don't deserve any of this. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm tearing up just cause like my life is just, you know, it can get chaotic at times, but just the grace that I've been given, I mean, my relationship with my wife and my daughter, like, I and to just be grateful for my wife and to be grateful for my daughter, it, it's just such, it's such a gift. And as a Christian, what changes me is the love of Christ. There's nothing I can do today to lose God's love. And for me, His strength is now my strength. And, you know, I, there's nothing I can do out on the track. There's nothing I can do in business. When I'm with my family, the grace I've been given there and the love I've been given there, I'm reminded of what God gave us, His Son. My name is Bobby O'Donnell, and I've been shown God's grace. Uh, you know, my strength wasn't enough. And I'm grateful today for the grace I've been shown and the strength I've been given through Christ. Alcohol is not the end of the story. Abuse, not the end of the story. Loss isn't the end of your story. Pandemic, not the end of the story. You see, Jesus died, but he didn't stay dead. First Peter 1 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is the life-altering message of Easter. Jesus was beaten. His body was broken. And Jesus did die a horrible death on a wooden cross, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the grave, and what I love about Easter is that we find that he did it all for you. The timeless message of Easter is that God loves you, and you, and you, and you so much that he would send his son Jesus for you. The Bible says if you believe in him that you will see and experience the power and the presence of God in your life. You see, Jesus, he offers each of us this living hope. Jesus offers to carry the weight of our sin and the weight of our lives. But Jesus won't make you believe. Jesus won't make you see him for who he is. And so as we close this morning, I simply want to give each of you the opportunity to respond to the love of God made known through the wooden cross and an empty tomb. Can we close our eyes this morning? I simply want to pray for you as we close our time. You see, maybe you're here and, and you might feel like Bobby in our video. And you might feel like you've tried to manage life on your own terms. But if you're honest, you know in your heart of hearts that everything that you have is simply not enough. 
I want you to know that this Easter Sunday, God is calling you home. The message of Easter is that sin doesn't win. Death doesn't win. Sickness, pain, brokenness, guilt, all the shame that you've ever felt, it does not win because Jesus rose victorious over the grave. And maybe you're here and these past 12 months have weighed you down. And you might say, you know what? I know Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ. But I just feel weighed down. If that's you this Easter Sunday, I want to pray for you. Just go ahead and slip up your hands so I know where you're at. Great. On the left, in the middle, I simply want to pray for you this Easter Sunday. Anyone need some prayer this Sunday? Wonderful. On the left, in the middle. Father, you see the hands raised all over this sanctuary and even watching online. But more important, you know our hearts. And so I am praying for a fresh breath of your presence and your power in your people's lives. I am praying that they might feel the strength of God and the anointing of God and the power of God made known through Jesus and his resurrection. And maybe you're here today and if you're really honest with yourself, you might say, I've got some stones in my life, some things that feel impossible. And if you're really honest, you also know that you've never asked God to be in control. I want you to know that the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And today I want to give you that opportunity. There is no better day than Easter Sunday to respond to Jesus, to say yes to Jesus, to ask Jesus to come into your life and wash you free and wash you clean. If that's you this morning and God is doing something in your heart, in your stomach, I guarantee it's not indigestion. I guarantee that's God who's calling you to himself. God wants to carry the weight of your sin if you'd let him. Today can be your day to say yes to Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to pray a simple prayer with every eye closed and every head bowed here this morning. A moment between you and your creator. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to just slip up your hand. Be bold this morning. You won't regret it. And I'm going to lead you in the most important prayer you'll ever pray. So on the count of three, if that's you, and I guarantee that so many of us here this morning, on the count of three, get ready. One, two, three. Go ahead all over this room. Wonderful. On the right. In the center. Great. In the center. If you want to say yes to Jesus this Easter, slip up your hand on the left, on the left, in the center. If you want to say yes to Jesus, this is your moment. Don't let it pass by. Don't let your eternal, eternal security pass by this morning. Anyone else right in the back, in the middle, in the very back, just begin to talk to God right where you sit. Right where you sit. You might want to just pray something like, Jesus, I acknowledge that you are Lord, that I am not. That you are the King, that you are Savior. I ask that you would come into my life in this very moment on Easter Sunday that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would help me walk with you all the rest of the days of my life. Jesus, we love you this morning. We are a grateful people. We worship, we celebrate, we rejoice in the risen King the Savior, the resurrected Jesus. And all God's people said, 
Amen and hallelujah. Let's give God a, a clap this morning online. Thank you so much. Hey, listen, listen. If you prayed that prayer this morning, we want to help you take your best next step. You can pull out your phone and just type in 797979 and just type in said yes. We want to help you with your best next step. We want to send you a free devotional, seven-day devotional, get you started on your journey with God. And I guarantee your very, very best next step is to get in the waters of baptism on April 25th. So God bless you guys. Have a great Easter Sunday with friends and family. Go celebrate the resurrected Jesus. See you real soon.